Greetings, ladies and genders. Welcome back to Zabio Arts. This is episode two of my series, Concept Art Class, where I illustrate an entire RPG card game and show off your designs as well. Today, we will be designing the Great Axe, the Throwing Dagger, and the staff. By the end of this tutorial, you will learn how to generate hundreds of ideas, how to filter the good ideas from the bad ideas, the basic anatomy of an axe, setting up your brush for digital painting, the basic lighting scenario that works on everything, how to render different metal surfaces and metal scratches, how to render different wood surfaces, including polished and matte finishes, Photoshop tips and tricks and shortcuts. Yes, all of those things in this one video. It's a thick one. And you can use these skills to help you design a set of items for your concept art portfolio, design weapons for your OC, take your sketches from flat colors to finished paintings. Baby, this is a thick one. Get comfy, get cozy, get your sketchbook, get some snacks, we're going through it all today. If you want me to see your designs and you want a chance to be in the next episode of Concept Art Class, check the end of this video for the hashtag for episode three. You posted your sketches using hashtag Zabio Arts weapons. Let's go through them. All right, so we're in the Zabio Arts fans amino. Ah, interesting, you did a concept sheet for each part of the throwing dagger. You did the blade and then the handle and that you made a note to keep it symmetrical. By the way, that's one of the differences between a dagger and a knife, is that a dagger, you'll see symmetrical blades, and it's a two-sided blade, so it'll both come to a point, whereas with a knife, it might just be a blade on one side. But you can have throwing knives, too. <coughs> Slightly different. There's, like, knives, daggers, darts, and then if you start to get a little crazy, there's, like, the throwing stars and other stuff. A dart is more like a little skinny pokey guy. Hell yeah, you even drew a character with a dynamic pose in the background and a close-up on the blade at the bottom with notes pointing to all the different parts that you designed. Well done, my friend. Does anybody know what program this is that they're using? Is this sketchbook? Maybe I should do a live stream next time so that you can be on the stream while I go through all of them and you can see yours. I like when everything has a theme, you know? Just making all of the handle parts into gnarled wood. If this was a card game, and you had that design for it, for like the druids of Saskatchewan or whatever, then you'd hold your cards out and they'd be all druidy, and you'd be like, yeah, this is the druid game. You know what I realized? Concept art pages, like a spread of designs, look so much better when you put notes on it. Like even this note right here that says runes glow when casting spells. It's a little bit redundant. Nobody really needs to be able to read that to know that rune symbols will glow when you use a spell. But putting it in there with an arrow that goes to it just adds an enormous amount of interest. I think I'm gonna start making notes on some of my drawings just as like an aesthetic. Oh, roots magically grow and stretch, convenient for reaching up high to grab items. That's interesting. What if you used it kind of like a Spider-Man web? So like you would have a... This will be my staff. So what if you have a staff and these guys are like, <laughs> ah, and it goes, <laughs> slings them off. Don't ask me why I have a hockey stick in here. It's for business reasons. Posted this on Insta already, but I suppose it can also be posted here. Good, this is where I'm seeing it first. Throwing dagger, meant to spin in the air. Oh, really? Because I throw throwing daggers like this. <laughs> this one's cool. I feel like if that counterweight were a little smaller, and I love the sharpie sharpie, and then this part, I know it's probably supposed to be sharp, but it looks like a blunt edge, like Thor's axe. You know, it's got one hammer side and one axe side. I like how I could see that you designed a bunch of them. Pick two, delve a, delve a little bit deeper into the details and the mechanics behind it, and then created your digital pieces to kind of show it off. Nothing super fancy with the coloring, but you don't need it. It makes it very clear. Very nice work. Oh, the story behind this is it's part of like the sword and the stone, but when he took the sword out of the stone, he just pulled the rock off and then chipped it to make the blade. Well, you can tell that they go together too because of the color palette. 
It's all the same type of material with like the same type of blue gem. Einsteingram, hashtag Xabio Arts Weapons. Hey, we got 91 people that posted on Instagram. That's awesome. Let's go most recent. Sally Marshmallow added this two hours ago. You're just in time. Ooh, a full page. A full page of designs. From what I can tell from these notes, the wood that makes the handle of this axe comes from a tree called, De that come from death trees, which uh, extracts a sap that is incidentally the power potion. These ones are nice. I don't know what it is about something super simple and rough like this. I love these. It's like just enough color just to get it to pop out so that you can kind of tell, tell what the vibe is. Ah yes, the infamous pizza dagger. Why didn't I think of that? You made a character for each one. This looks very similar to the type of stuff that I was doing when I first started digital art. It had like a weird flash in my brain like, hey, wait a minute, somebody posted my art. I feel like this is, we're already starting to get to a cliche right now, which is the big round shape with like a, a ball on the end or a floating ball on the end, you know what I mean? I have a feeling that we're gonna be seeing a lot of those. I haven't looked through them yet, I've cheated and saw some of them because I was really excited before I started filming this, but I'm trying to make this my first time seeing all of them. Holy shiznips. Look at that. That's a lot of designs. Look at this. Figurosity even liked your stuff. Shout out to Figurosity. Put a lot of time into engineering this. Appreciate that. Oh, snap. There's a character for each one. Oh, my God. With a background and everything. That staff character looking like a marching band director who could turn you into a sheep and then butcher you and then feed you to your family as lamb chops. Then there's that Ryu looking guy who's got an axe instead of uh, karate muscles. He's a pretty skinny guy for holding a giant axe, but hey, I'm not judging you. His muscles might be super coiled, tighter than a carnivore. And then... There's little Miss Muffet sitting on her little tuffet down there with her throwing daggers about to chase the spider away. I'm gonna get my eight legs and skedaddle, baby. They all have different themes and they're all beautiful. I love the shout out to Pink Floyd right there. Appreciate you. Hey, there's me nine months before my birthday. Oh yeah, color variations with different textures for the tips. Why does it look like I have a mullet? Hi, my name is Theo Vaughn. <laughs> Aha, uh -huh, there's another curvy with the floaty. There's another curvy with the dangly bits. Okay, I gotta say that third axe really, really gets my blood flowing. I love it so much and I don't exactly know why. I love the description on this. It's like you hit uh, the suggested word on your keyboard. I just kept going until it made a sentence. This is a lot like what my early digital art looked like too. Yeah, see what I mean? It looks so much cooler with the notes, doesn't it? Oh my god! Two-handed axe, those are sharp knuckles. Two-handed staff. This staff comes with a pre-installed app. You even put the hashtag in there too? Brilliant, love these gems, baby, yummy. So this gem determines the weapon skills and abilities, so different gems Reading the notes on these are always the best. Hey Andrew, hope that you can see this. First of all, sorry for my bad English. No, 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 you're good. Don't even worry about it, your English is beautiful. Actually, there are some things I wanna tell. I know that you're not looking for any finished or good art, but I really love you, not only as an artist, but as a person. I appreciate that so much. You don't love me as a person, though. You love me as a host of a very inconsistent uh, YouTube show. Um, but I'm grateful that you love my art and my uh, YouTube videos. So when I saw this card game thing, I was like, oh man, I have to join this. It would really be sad if you didn't see what I've done though. So notice me, senpai. Okay, I notice you. Whatever, just know that there are a lot of people who love you and one of them is me. Appreciate that, love you right back. You're amazing, your art is amazing, your attitude is amazing, you're a beautiful person. Damn, look at that axe. If it doesn't work, hit him with it. Wait, wait, you gotta, gotta hit him with that. Uh, down below, uh, uh. John Mulaney. I do art things, as one does. Knives, nice. A blunt dagger is as good as a sharp one if you know how to throw it hard enough. Hi, I'm Grayson. <laughs> Diamond throwing dagger. Damage 25. 25 what? 
gigawatts if you took my little pony and turned them into anime girls and then turned those anime girls into various weapons that's what this looks like and i'm kind of digging it mm, look at this they all come in a set another one who decided to do tree branches for the handles but hey it's cohesive man it works it's just that a lot of other people have that same idea too. Must be something in our psyche that a bunch of humans have the exact same idea. Curvy floaty. Oh, hi, nice to meet you. Um, this a senpai, uh, double-sided blade. Yes. Ah, glorified pizza cutter. Yes, that's what I need. That's what I need to go with the pizza dagger. We're gonna create a pizza hero for this game. And he's gonna have a whole set of pizza weapons. He's gonna be the Papa Warrior. Damn, that looks good. I agree. Oh, look at these stabs! Curvy floaty. So many. It's a sim staff. Controls people. Curvy floaty. Looks so sh No, it doesn't. You know what it looks like sh That attitude. Turn that frown upside down. Be proud of yourself. You posted this. You spent the time doing it. You did it. Curvy floaty. You smell like cheese. <laughs> Why? Words can be used as a weapon as well. So mind what you say and be nice to each other. And they can be used as a weapon of healing. So use your words to give people verbal hugs. We all deserve love, especially you, Grandma. Uh, your words got deep, deeper than any blade. A luxurious staff, not meant to scam you. That is the cutest murder machine I've ever seen. Although you can say that for just cats too. It doesn't have to be a dagger for it to be a murder machine. Sun Eater, Dragon Slayer. They look like star-crossed lovers, torn between two realities, each craving the other, despite it being their downfall. I don't know. You'd make a spiral-shaped hole if you stab somebody with that. You realize that, right? Maybe a diamond or something? I don't know. Yeah, so bunch of sketches, bunch of sketches, and then picked the ones that you liked and then made the, oh man, yes. Beautiful, beautiful work. Look at this. It's scribbled on, man, and it's perfect. I get the exact same vibe as I would if it was beautifully illustrated. Yes, well done. Please have some normal concept art with the fizzle. No way. Boom, boom, boom. Mop will kill. Oh my god, look how beautiful this presentation is. Turtle soup art. I want to check out your other stuff. You have some legitimately good draw. Oh my god. <laughs> this is so good. And you made a face out of a toilet paper roll. This is the mark of a true artist. Follow back. Thank you, my man. Oh man, beautiful axe. Look at that. Curvy floaty. That looks like the Batman symbol. Look at all these staff designs. Curvy floaty. Another perfect one made on an Insta story with your finger and some really, really primitive digital art software. Sends the same message as it would if it were a nicely colored painting. Nicely painted, whatever. It's a throwing dagger or whatever. My jumper smells like macas. <laughs> not that big, quite small, but not that small. Or not big or not too small, so like medium. <laughs> Man, Ethan Riddle, your notes read like a book. Another Ethan Riddle. We woo it. <laughs> Ethan Riddle, what is Ethan Riddle? What is your Instagram? <laughs> Follow this, mad lad. I feel like I have no purpose. Zabu Arts and Minecraft bring joy to my soulless, empty life. Wait, Dalatubbies also bring me joy. I love them. Twitter. Hashtag Zabu Arts Weapons. My boy, I hope I am not too late with this. I screwed up. This is a regular ass dagger, not a throwing one. Drawn on iPad using Procreate app. I gotta get them to sponsor me, man. Sponsor me, haunts me. Stronger than me. Stronger than hearts and the, I'm hearts and hot and the, hot and the lawless. I'm lawless and flawless. Lawless and heartless and flawless and ballless. I'm a ballless baller. I ball without balls. I ballin' on the baller. Holla at the bala bala. A gala holla bala. <laughs> holla waka bala. <laughs> Zabio Arts, hope you like it. I like it. Thank you. <laughs> Curvy floaty. What time is it? It's spooky time, Jared Fisher. 
My God, I retweeted this one too. Look at how many designs, and look, you get a vibe just by popping in a little bit of color on each one, like this. It doesn't need to be rendered in gold. You just have to put some yellow on there and people know what it means. Oh my God, curvy floaty. Shout out to Snifflig for posting it in multiple places. Make sure I see it. This is Obunga stuff. Look at that face, so sassy. You a sassy bird. Oh my God, dude, it's like, um, uh, Frick. Dude, it's like that Sprouse guy from Riverdale. Cuz, I'm the bad guy. Duh. In case you haven't noticed, I'm weird. I'm a weirdo. I don't fit in, and I don't want to fit in. Maybe I don't fit in, okay? Maybe I'm not super cool. Maybe I don't shower regularly. So maybe I eat my toenails. Maybe I copy Chris Farley. I don't own a toothbrush or let my scabs heal. I can't reach all the parts of my body. I feel that's a trend, but a broom with two hatchets. Is that a trend? <laughs> Xavier Arts Weapons. Ah, uh, there are two posts on Facebook now. Artwork for one of my favorite YouTubers card game he's created. Ah, oh, you're so precious. Artistry Alexis. Oh, you even drew the little X logo? Like, like. Hey, nah! All right, let's get to building some G. Let's go to Pinterest. Okay, so I have a Pinterest board full of weapons just for this tutorial. And sometimes it can be a weird thing that I liked, such as, the fact that this crystal is like glued to this thing and it's got like a weird base to it. Probably not gonna use that, but I liked it. And so when I see all of this stuff together, I'm kind of getting an idea of like what I wanna see on the paper and what I wanna see when I'm holding these cards in my hand. Oh, and the key to drawing good weapons is to use a pencil that's wrapped in giraffe leather. <laughs> Shark, ah, don't put that in your mouth. First of all, what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at some reference images and see if we can detect the anatomy of each one of these types of weapons. So it looks like with the ax, there's a couple of different ways that you can do it. But the way that you can design an ax without having it attached to anything is you have a, a rock that's shaped like that, and then you put it inside a thing with like a hole in it. So once you do that, and it goes through there, then it becomes like that. And what happens is when you hit with this side, then it pushes that in and it just wedges it tighter and tighter and tighter and tighter and tighter and tighter. So it's more of a club, not really an ax, but that's one way that you can attach it. And then there's the way of having this stuff screwed on. There's also the method of, so it's just a thing that like fits on the end of the ax. I don't know, I'm assuming what you would have to do is have like some sort of a wedge that you would hammer down. This is kind of like what it would look like from the top down perspective. And so you'd stick the wedge right in there and hammer it in like. I don't think I have anything, I have a pretzel. So what you do is you take like this pretzel, jam it in there and then hammer that in and that would split this thing apart. And while it's in there, it would expand and then create like a... That's an interesting way to do it. What about the daggers though? This one, it looks like the blade could be uh, like that. And then the handle on top or underneath or whatever has like a hole in it. There's that. You hold them together maybe through like screws or whatever. That's kind of how kitchen knives are set up. Or there's like this one where it's the handle that comes up and attaches to the blade. In which case the blade would still have this thing going inside the handle, but this handle instead would be that on either side. I'm not sure which direction I wanna go with that. It could be like this too, where it's basically all one piece, just like we had before, uh, except it has like some binding for a handle. So it looks like with the ax, either two or three parts. We could either have it be in two parts, which is the handle and the axe head, or in three parts, which is like this, to where a little mini axe, but then the axe 
blades are actually coming through like that because they're attached right here. So we could either do it like that or like that or try to do a combination of the two where maybe it's like technically the same material but it's just got like designs and embellishments on it so it kind of looks like it has two parts. There's this thing that you can do which is also take something like this but then bind it in like leather or something. Ancient weapons are so fascinating. What people were able to do with what they had, they could do things that we can't do now. Okay, so now that we have the anatomy kind of figured out, let's start designing some stuff. Getting my boring ideas out of the way first. Uh, we'll copy that one over. That just looks like a game controller. Whatever. I'm definitely doing a double-sided axe for this design. Let's start with a circle and then carve out the shapes from there. To do that, I guess you would start with a circle. You would draw two more circles right here, making sure that there's a gap. And then you would draw another circle right here, but in the middle. And then you would just add the handle. And then literally all you have to do is just erase that top and the bottom part. And then if you were to ink that, well, you get so geometric with it. I kind of figured out that I want this if I just add a little curve there, will that make a difference to the overall feeling? But I don't want to get too far on paper because it's so much faster in digital. All right, let's design some daggers. That one does not, so let's just add some curves to it. I'm getting there, but I feel like it's too heavy on the back. So instead, we'll bring in the curve. What happens if we try to sh geometricize it? I have a feeling that I'm not going to like having it come out and then back in like that. I think I like it like this, with like a beveled edge. But what if we just did it straight across? No, I like this beveled edge. So the difference between a dagger and a knife is that a dagger is usually symmetrical and the blade is on both sides, so both sides are sharp. Whereas a knife can, you know, look like, but knives can also be two-sided. I think it's like a square and a rectangle type of thing. One of them is one of them and the other one is not the other one. Maybe like little wrappy things right here or something. No, that was too much. The staff, I gotta include the curvy floaty. The good thing about this is that everybody knows that it's a magic staff. The bad thing about it is it could be boring in the wrong setting. What if we did the goat thing? And it's got like dangly bits here. Only focusing on shapes first. I don't even care that my sketches are bad looking, but it's easier to design shapes in a digital art program, so let's go to that. Going back in my mind, when I was learning how to draw, and I was like, how do I work a digital art program? What is a brush, whatever? I, I needed a lot more information than they gave me, and I felt like a lot of times they'd be like, okay, take your brush and start blending this way. I didn't know what that meant. Go to your brush panel, your whatever digital art program you're in is gonna be different, so you go to like window, brushes or whatever and you'll find like a list of brushes. Pick like one of the chalky brushes or sketch brush or whatever, right? And then somehow find the window that's like where, it, what's it called? Brush settings? Yeah, so I have it right here, easy, convenient, but you, I don't know what yours looks like. Okay, there's a few things that you can do here. If you start coloring, sometimes your brush will just look like this. All right, my color is set to black, my foreground color, and it's not doing anything. This sucks. Turn transfer on. Okay, that way when you go with your pen, you, if you do it lightly, very light, it's kind of transparent, right? And if you do it hard, then it becomes black. You can vary it back and forth, and then see how good you can get at creating smooth transitions. And then you can get some cool things like this. The other thing I like to do is put shape dynamics on so that brush will also get smaller when you draw lighter. Pen pressure. Now let's get into how we did silhouettes, okay? So we're gonna start with black. We're gonna decrease the opacity to 60%. Chalky brush, I don't care which chalk brush it is. The transfer and everything is turned on. So we're gonna, let's do an ax, okay? So we'll create like, um, half of an X, right? Just some random shapes. Then what I'll do is I'll select like half of it, control J and J again. You can delete that bottom one. And you can go control T, 
right click, flip horizontal, hit OK, and then drag it so that it's um, uh, holding shift so that it, it goes straight, and then you come out with this guy. Then you can hit Control E so that they will merge together. Now check this out. We're going to erase some stuff from here, and we're going to draw some stuff. And I've already seen that there's sort of like a, a shape that's coming in right here. I could do the Control J, Control J thing, or I could select half of it, delete it, deselect it, Control D, and then I could hit Control J to duplicate it, and then flip it horizontal again. There's a bunch of different ways that you can do things. Now you got an axe that's okay. All you need for the silhouettes is just the vibe of something. All right, and eventually, as you keep going throughout the silhouettes, um, the the things that you start drawing at first will change. So, like this time, I know I should probably start with the shaft of it. I'll create some little details. I, my brush stroke gets smaller and smaller. Maybe I'll add some little details over here. And then I know that uh, maybe if I do some scribblies, that it'll come up with a different design. All right, and if I scribble over here, maybe something will happen there. And instead of deleting half of it, I'll just hit Control J and then flip it. And then, all right, that's a different vibe for the X. Now we have two. And you just keep doing that over and over and over again, like 30 times at least. And then eventually, once you pick one that you do like, You'll create a copy. I just held Alt and then dragged it, right? And then you'll pick out some of these shapes and you'll just start blending these colors together and kind of finding the shapes that are already in there. And now you have that axe redefined. Basically the same vibe, except it's just the information is a little bit more clear. And so that's how I like to come up with different designs. It's how a lot of artists do it. Start with the overall shape, the overall vibe, and then get into the details from there. Uh, by the way, there are so many to choose from. You guys will all have your favorites. Everybody's different. In the end, this is my game, so I ain't gonna pick what I want, okay? You know what, I'm gonna number this so that you can tell me what your favorite silhouette is. So I selected just the head of the ax, hit Control T so that I can shrink it down because I think it's a little too big. But what I'm doing is I'm putting this, this part right here, this middle part, I'm grabbing it and putting it in the center of the X so that when I hit Alt, Shift, hold those two together, and then drag the corner down, it'll drag it toward the center of that point. Enter. Control D to deselect. I think I like this one, except I'm going to make this go up here. Copy it over here. What if we took the whole head of it, just turned it upside down? Let's copy this guy down, turn the blade so it's kind of facing out. What if I just bring this blade down a little bit? That's interesting. We could do something with that. It's such a good feeling to know that you can learn how to make stuff like this without having to go to school. I learned how to do this stuff by watching videos on YouTube, and that's why I'm making these videos. So as I was creating these weapons, I knew that I was gonna want to go back and create tutorials for the different aspects of uh, what went into them, how to, how to blend certain textures together, how to draw, how to do the line work. So as I was creating them, I separated out all the layers when I made a significant change, and I'm gonna go through all of those layers right now. So we're gonna take all of this away, and we're just gonna start with the lines. To create the lines, a lot of times you'll have to undo the last line that you did, and then draw it again, undo, draw it again, undo, draw it again, over and over and over. And there's another technique that I use that I see a lot of other artists use, which is you'll draw a line that goes all the way across, and then another one that goes all the way across, and then you'll erase these two things, and then it becomes a nice little corner. How cute is that? That way, you don't have those weird moments where it goes here, and then it like stops, and it goes right here, and then it stops, and then you get this weird, you just want it to connect like that. That's how you do it.
Also, when I was done with all of the line work at the very end, selected the outside of it. So like we got these outlines, right? It looks fine. But we'll take this, we'll select in between the lines, control shift I so that uh, it inverts the selection, which means instead of selecting the outside of this thing, you're selecting all of this in the middle. And then you go up here to edit, stroke, and then you'll have to play around with how, how much it is. I always do the center though and uh, put the color to black. And uh, I'm going to put it at 40 just so it's going to be super extreme so you'll see what happens. See what I mean? So then it creates a big ass out line. So I did that, picked the outline size that I liked, and then I put those way up at the top, and in here, this was me just experimenting with other stuff, um, so I'll just ignore that for now. It's stuff that I tried and I didn't like. This is the stuff that I kept. So this is the information that I started with. All right, and then I decreased the opacity to something like that, I don't know, whatever you like and then I drew on top of it to make these nice crisp lines. So we have our lines. The first, very, very, very first thing that I did was to make the background gray. I did like a 50% gray, I don't know, what is this? 51%, whatever. I'm somewhere in the middle between black and white. Colors look different depending on what type of colors surround the color. I'll give you an example right now, okay? You just want to make sure that in any context, the image will look nice. Whether it has a photo behind it, whether it's black or white or whatever, it's got to look good. So that's why I decided to go with a 50% gray because if we take all of the color out of these things, there are lights and darks. 50% gray is a good average to make sure that your thing will look good with some sort of background. Then, I filled in everything with darker gray. Just so that it's like cutting it out with an X-Acto knife, all right? Now just wait, you're gonna follow me with this one, okay? These next layers are something called a clipping mask, which means, if you don't know, you can right click a layer and go create clipping mask. I put in some flat colors, which means if I take this brown, and I color over the top of the whole thing, it will only color that gray that's underneath. So it's a really easy way to color inside the lines. One less thing you have to think about. So I made some bad flat colors. It's fine, it's generally the colors that I want. I didn't really care too much. I didn't put any thought into it. Next thing I did was on another layer, set to multiply, I put a color that's like a light gray that has a little bit of a purplish tint to it. Set it to multiply so that it makes whatever color is underneath it, you know, these flat colors, these bad ones, makes those colors darker, all right? So this one gives it a little bit of depth, a little bit of shadow, and it kind of forces you to see it as a 3D shape a little bit, very rough and I didn't even care about coloring inside the lines very much. I'd fix that later. Next one was the highlight layer. It's the exact same thing as the multiply layer, but except instead of setting it to multiply, you set it, I set it to soft light. You could also do screen is a good one. Um, linear dodge sometimes works, um, but I did soft light in this case. It's a good safe choice, and the color of this one is like, um, it's like a gray with a tiny bit of like a yellowish tint, I guess. And that's because in nature, shadows are almost always blue. Have you ever seen snow? Blue is the color of shadows. So we took those, that purple layer, set it to multiply so it made it a little bit darker, just kind of on the edges because we want the middle of these things to stick out. So if you have a sphere, this part is going to stick out towards you, and then this part is going to be all in shadow as it fades back into the distance, baby. And so I wanted it to look like it had sort of natural lighting. The blue shadows and then the yellow highlights kind of mimicking sunlight a little bit. All right, so we got flat colors, 
shadows and highlights, very basic, not coloring inside the lines. After that, I started to render the, uh, the metal on the axe. This is the part that's hard until you realize that it's not, all right? This part right here was all just this one gray, but then what I did is I, I picked that color, moved it up just a little bit until I got uh, a gray that's like this, and then I just blended that in so that it was a gradient between dark right here and light right here, all right? So you got dark up here, light down here, and then you blend them together so that it makes uh, marriage made for heaven. This is also the other point when you gotta think about lighting. Where is your light coming from? For this one, I kinda wanted like a top-down light because it's easy and fast, and I don't have time to try to be fancy, and I don't care about, I don't have an ego when it comes to art. I know most of my art sucks. I know I'm not technically the best artist in the world. I know there's a lot of stuff that I don't know, but this is how I get past it, okay? You stick to what you're good at. And simple lighting scenarios, easy. It does the job, that's all I need. All right, so with this top-down view, you got the light coming from down here, which means it's gonna catch this guy. Here, I'll show you something. This is how I always think about it, okay? So we'll take this, and we'll say the light is hitting like the top of this spoon, or you could say that the light is hitting like right here. Okay, so that's like a spoon that's facing you and facing away. And the difference is because this guy goes, bounces off. This one, when it catches, it actually misses what's in the middle right here. Light doesn't get there. It only hits what's sticking out which is that, and then up here at the top. So if the light is coming from up here, then it's gonna catch this part, and this part is not gonna show it. So that would be like a concave shape. But then this one is convex, which means it looks, it's, sticks out like the beer belly of your bully from high school. And now he doesn't have the skills to effectively communicate his wants and needs, so he hides behind his alcohol. So when the sunlight comes, it's gonna hit this part and then bounce off. But I can't even draw on the outside of this because of that clipping mask. Same with this one, this is convex, which means the light is gonna hit right here and bounce off all over the place. And then this part is gonna not be receiving any light as much. Same with this one, the light's gonna hit right in the middle of a cylinder. This is why it's important to learn how to render, which means shade different 3D shapes, because this right here is just a cylinder. This is very obviously a cylinder. This is like, you think about, I think about this as part of a sphere. If you can shade basic shapes, you can shade pretty much anything. So I started adding some highlights on here, and then getting that gradient in there. I duplicated this side, copied and pasted it, and put it right here. So these two sides are basically the same. I just took out this crack so it wouldn't look like it's the same. And then I added some highlights up on the top. Now, the reason why I made the edges of the metal lighter is because that's another part where it sticks out. You have something like this, this part, where the fingers meet together, that's where it sticks out the most. So that's where the light is gonna catch it. After that, I tried to break it up a little bit. You can see I just started alternating from light and dark here. And then I started just adding in some like shadowy colors and then blending those out so there was, let's zoom in here, okay? Let's see what we're doing. You can see right here, there's a harsh edge and then it blends out. Here's a great example, harsh edge right there. And then you take that shadow and just blend it out. And that'll give the illusion of depth. I still haven't blended any of this and I'm not even coloring inside the lines. A lot of this doesn't even matter. Next what I did is I took a light brown color and just made some lines to make it look like wood maybe. Kinda looks like wood, good enough. This is why it's nice to be an artist who is curious about the world. When you're always looking at things and observing, 
then you put that in your memory and now you have like a beautiful little Pinterest board in your brain. You know what I mean? So I thought about all the times that I'd seen wood and those little swirls and how it goes around knots and stuff like that. And uh, I also looked up some reference images as well. I took all the information that was here and then just colored it inside the lines. The only thing that I really added was I picked this color right there and then I bumped up the lightness a little bit and then I just added it to right here because I was thinking of the same thing as this part right here. You know how the, the bottom part of that catches the light because it's like concave or whatever? If it's like this, sunlight is going to hit this part and it's not going to really catch this very much. You know what I mean? So that's what this is down here. It's basically just me coloring inside the lines on this. After that, I decided that I didn't like the darkness of the axe, so I lightened that up just a little bit. Did some of these uh, sharp lines and then fading out, but I wanted most of the detail to be in this middle part and then the outside part. I didn't really want a lot of detail on this darker part. After that, I looked at some reference images of a metal cylinder and saw how light wrapped around that, and I thought it looks a lot more realistic if the highlight was not exactly super in the center. All right, so there's like a strong highlight here, and there's like a weaker highlight here, and then darker in the middle. I wouldn't have thought of that on my own. It only came from looking at reference images, so it's super important if you're stuck look at something that is close to what you're trying to draw. I'm not going to be able to find this exact X, but I know that that is a metal cylinder. So if I Google metal cylinder, then I'll see the type of lighting scenarios that can affect that material in that shape. You know what I mean? After that, I did some more refining to the, um, the edges of this guy. Thought about the lighting in the details. So like if I zoom in, you'll see that the light catches these parts right here because they're kind of sticking out a little bit from the rest of the handle. But I also remember that as a whole, the highlight is really just right here. So I can't go very much past this part right here. So you're not going to see that same thing over here because this whole area is in shadow. So this is me just basically coloring inside the lines a little bit more. This is convex, means it sticks out like your bully's beer belly. Next thing I did was just color inside the lines a little bit more on these straps. All of the information was already there. All the colors from the multiply layer with the shadows and the soft light layer with the highlights. All that information is there. There's a little bit of a color variation because the blue kind of affects the straps and then the yellow from the highlight affects the straps a little bit differently. It's perfect. It looks like I know what I'm doing and I don't. This layer, it's hard to tell. It's just me coloring inside the lines a little bit more, making it a little bit more less rough, I guess. Sometimes we like it rough, sometimes we don't. Sometimes we just want a nice, respectful, clean cut, colored inside the lines look. This one, I copied this edge right here over to the other edge. And then after that, I smoothed it out a little bit so that it didn't look exactly the same. This layer right here, I looked up reference images for a polished wood handle, and I found that it's basically, a lot of times, a dark wood color, whatever kind of brown the wood is, but then, there's a very strong specular highlight, which means just the, if you don't know, it, specular highlight just means like, it's the, it's like that thing on the tip of your nose, right? It's, it's a very bright highlight that sticks out. It's like, hey, I'm a highlight. No subtleness about it, this is me. I'm just being me, I'm not like other girls, okay? I don't blend in. <laughs> I'm specular. I think you mean spectacular, Becky. That's what I said. Kombucha. Why do you drink kombucha? It's all about the culture. But those are little tiny organisms. Isn't that committing liquid genocide? Yeah, I'm American. And so I noticed that it's a, a bright highlight. So what I did was, it's really, really, really easy. So what you do is, you take a white, 
create a line, get your eraser. This one I'll maybe I'll do like a big soft airbrush and set the opacity to like 30% or something up here. And then I'll just erase so that it, it it doesn't have an edge anymore. Lower the opacity. That's really it. And if it's too thick, bust down a little bit. Done. Easy highlight. And see this this is the type of stuff like I didn't know that some of these things were so easy when I was first starting and I was like how the hell am I going to be able to do digital art? I don't I don't even know how to color without like on on paper. How am I going to be able to do this? And so that's what this channel is all about. If you got a question about a specific thing or you need help with something, tell me. I am here to help you. That is the whole point of this channel. If you don't have the resources for school or whatever, maybe there can be a few tips that you could learn here. But if you're looking at this and you go I don't know, something's off. It doesn't look like, uh, what you first showed me? There's a reason. I went to here, went to levels, so that it will create another layer, so that everything below this layer will be affected by this guy. Now, since it has this arrow, that means it is also a clipping mask, which means it won't affect the background. Thank God, I don't want to change that gray. You're a perfect gray. Now, what you can do is mess with all the lights and the darks. You can make the lights lighter, you can make the darks darker, you can make all the colors in between go lighter or darker, whatever you want. So we can take this guy, which is the whites, the light colors, make them lighter. You can take this, which represents black, you can make that darker. Small adjustment, it didn't do much, but it brightened up the whole thing because I thought it looked kind of muddy. So you see, I just brought the light. I think all I did was bring the lights up a little bit. I don't know if I messed with this one or not. Next one after that is I created a gradient map. All of these start with clicking on this button and then selecting one of those things. A gradient map is, it's an interesting thing. It assigns a color to a value. So value talks about just whether something is light or dark, regardless of the color. The only thing that matters is whether it's dark or light. So with this one, what I did was I wanted to change the metal to look a little bit more metally. I made the, the dark parts purple, going up through uh, tealish, and then ending with a gray. And what that did is I got the opacity of this layer set to 18%. So you're not going to see that much of a change. But if I increased it, that is what I did to the blade. It looks shiny. It looks like uh, light is catching it. That's a little bit too much. So I bumped it down to like 18 or 20 or whatever. I don't know. It doesn't matter. And now, if you notice the difference, it's a, a very small difference. But it's one of those finishing details that people's brains will see and process whether they know it or not. It's going to happen in their subconscious. Their subconscious, at least, is going to know that those colors only happen in a different lighting scenario than, like, plastic or something. Plastic is not going to make those colors. This needs metal. The next one after that was a hue and saturation color blending mode. I don't know what it is called. Not a blending. Adjustment layer. That's what they're called. It just shows you how much I know about this. I don't know what they're called. I just know what they do. The only thing I did was th with this was just bump up the saturation. So if you only want a certain part of the drawing to be affected, create a mask layer. And then when you paint on this, you only paint in black or white. Black hides the color or the effect, and white reveals it. So let's bump this all the way up to the max, right? And I, this is my foreground color right here, white. So if I color the rest of this drawing, then you'll see that all the, everything else gets affected, right? But if I hit X so that these two switch and then I'm coloring with black, then I can color those other things and be like, mm, maybe I don't want all that stuff to be affected. Maybe I only want that specific part of the axe to be affected. So that's what I did. And I did a similar thing with the hue and saturation because if I disable this layer mask, you will see that I colored with a gray, which means it's not just 
a black and white yes or no sort of situation. It's I wanted the some parts of it to be more saturated, some parts of it to be less saturated. So I colored on the parts that I wanted to be less affected by this saturation. So now when I bump up the saturation, it gives it a little bit more life and vibrance, a little bit more cartoony, which is fine. I don't want it to look like I'm making super serious weapons here. No part of this is serious. It's very informal. I'm just doing it for fun. But you can see how you start with the lines, create the gray outline, just making the gray on the parts that you're going to color. Do a quick multiply layer with a light purple, a quick soft light layer with a light yellow, and then basically just blend those colors together until they fit inside the lines. The other thing that I did was I took some of these lines on the inside and I colored them. The way to do that is you click this thing, which means lock transparent pixels apparently. And now if I choose a really weird color, it'll only color the lines. So I can make this whole thing look <laughs> like that. How I used that function was, all of this was black. I took this color, I picked a color that was a little darker, and then I colored it in like that. It takes a little bit of the edge off. It almost makes it look like it's a little bit more painted. But I kept the black outline because I didn't want it to look too, too serious, like I was trying to make it a gorgeous painting or anything. I just wanted to do something quick, make it look okay enough. And see, when you first look at this without seeing how it's broken down and stuff, you're like, oh my god, it looks like you painted that. I mean, technically, yeah, I did, but all I did was just lay in some colors and then blend them to fit inside the, the lines. Easy! I did not care about coloring very nicely. There was something that I messed with, which was rim lighting or highlight on the outside, but I thought it looked like I was trying too hard. And basically what that was is it's another layer clipping mask, whatever. And I just took like this little airbrush and did like a white line on the outside. And since the outlines are on top of all those things, the highlight went underneath it, it looked great. I think it looks great, but I feel like it just looks like I'm trying too hard to make it look like a painting. That's my layer breakdown. Now if you're wondering, okay, great, fine, that kind of helps, but how do I actually blend the colors together? In this tutorial, we are going through all of it. All right, let's talk about the different ways to blend. We'll start by doing what I like to do on paper, which is to take a rectangle and put black on one end, white on the other end, and create some diversity. Black and white are always great on their own, and they're great together. Everyone's great. New layer, never draw on the background layer. That's my rule, because I always mess up. New layer, but I'll put it underneath, because if you start, like if you start drawing, I want to be able to see that. So I'll put it underneath. Now the black line is on top. Green is underneath, that looks like a weird battery thing. Cool. All right, so I'll take a black color, go until it's white, but that doesn't look good. This is too dark over here. How do I fix it? Well, what you can do is hold Alt or whatever, select white, and then start doing the other thi that same thing, but going back. Now if you like squint your eyes, you'll be like, all right, it kind of blends together. That's when you do something interesting. I'll hit the number six, which changes it to 60% opacity so that when I pick this, even if I color super light, it's still going to show some of the information underneath. I'm a little bit heavy handed when I draw. So then I'll come in and brush really lightly and keep picking colors and making new colors around it. And I'll keep going until the transition gets so smooth. I'm going to get into a little bit of a personal opinion thing right now. I think a lot of times when artists start out, and I'm speaking about myself as well, I did this, and I'm still kind of fighting myself for it. I try to make things look too smooth and too nice. I think sometimes we forget that there is a charm to imperfections, just like with people. You know, you become so perfect that there's nothing interesting about you anymore. Flaws don't have to be flaws. It's just something that makes you you and you're aware of it, 
And the thing is, when you own it, it becomes endearing. You can have these imperfections like this, but if you need to make something super smooth, there's another way that you can blend things together, okay? This next method of blending that I'm gonna show you is something that really made my drawings bad for a long time, or paintings, whatever. And that's because I tried to be too perfect with it. This is a great technique that you can use, but it can also make your drawings or paintings look very artificial. I'm actually gonna pick the straight lasso tool by right-clicking and then coming over to that guy. I'm gonna select this outside line and then I'm gonna fill it with a gray. Deselect it. I can take a black color, go to big soft airbrush. Every program will have an airbrush. I'll set the opacity to like 30% and I'll brush in some black. And then I'll pick some white and I'll brush in some white. And if you don't like those little marching ant guys for the selection, hit Control H. And now you have a beautiful gradient. But you'll notice that looks super digital. That looks fine. That one looks very, you know? Control G, put them in a group so I can ignore them. Now I'm gonna go to that uh, chalky thing, chalky brush again. You'll notice my line doesn't seem to be working very much. That's because I'm actually still selecting that rectangle. So I'll do Control D to deselect, or actually Control A, delete everything. Control D, deselect. Now I can draw freely. Now remember, I'm gonna create a layer underneath it so that that circle will stay there. For whatever color you want the ball to be, it's gonna be a ball, okay, sphere. We ball in here. Now, on top of that, I'm gonna create a clipping mask. So what you can do is right click, click create clipping mask, hold alt, and then click in between the layers, or control alt G to create a clipping mask, however you wanna do it. This is how I did the, the whole painting, okay? So I'll come in with shadow color, a little bit gray, and like a little bit bluish purple. This transfer thing is still turned on, so I get a little bit of blending in there. Cool, right? Set this to multiply. If I think it's too purple, I'll do Control U, and then I'll decrease the saturation just a little bit. I can even sh change the color too if I want. Create a new layer, Control Alt G. This one is gonna be the same thing, except it's gonna be a little bit uh, yellowy orangey. Okay, and I'll set the opacity to like 30% or something. We'll set that to soft light. Now what we can do is we can actually change this base color to whatever we want. So I'll hit colorize for this multiply guy. I'm gonna actually make it a little darker. That's fine. Now that's infinitely more interesting than if we were to increase the brightness and then decrease the brightness. In the right lighting conditions, yeah, that could work, but it usually turns out muddy if you don't add other colors to it, right? On a new layer, we can just color pick and blend just like we did with that rectangle. Pick this color, a new color has arrived. And since we're on 30% opacity, we won't accidentally go too dark and uh, it'll let us make a lot more mistakes. Cool, we blended a disgusting looking sphere. Next one, we'll do a clipping mask. We'll pick this, make it a little bit brighter decrease the saturation, and then right here in the middle of this thing will create just like a specular highlight. And if I don't like how messy it looks, I'll go to my smudgy tool, increase the strength to like 60 or whatever, and we'll see if we can get some interesting shapes going here. Right, now it's a shiny ball. If there's something underneath, like let's say grass, right? Then what would happen is you would get some bounce light, which means you take this color because it's gonna come down and then bounce off and hit that. But I'm only gonna set the opacity to like 10%, and you start coloring this bounce light. So depending on how shiny that ball is, it's gonna reflect that light. Now we can do something interesting with this. We can take that highlight color, but remember that convex and concave lesson that we had? So that means we'll take this shadow color and we'll put it at the top, because we want these eyes to be set in a little bit. Specular highlights always go at the end little eyeballs here. Make it like a little bit of a shadowy color down here because these eyes are spheres as well. The white specular highlight, the eyes are all nice and shiny. 
create like a little shapey shapey. Take the highlight color right here, bring it down here because this is going to catch the light. I didn't have to pick any of those colors. I just did multiply and soft light. Easy! And then it's very easy to push stuff around. So we'll take the color that's around it and we'll make them very mad. Take this shadow color. That's why it's important to know how to shade a sphere, cylinder, prisms, cubes, stuff like that. Because if you can do that, then you can do characters like this. Now let's learn something else, how to shade metal. So we'll lay in the rough colors, which will be a uh, dark gray here, and then a lighter gray up here. You can already see it starting to take shape. Oh, and I only want this part to be darker, so I'll go to Levels, Control L, this part down. There, fine. I can take this color, make it a little bit lighter, and put that at the bottom. And we'll blend that up to meet this color right here. Do that on both sides. All right, then what we're gonna do is we're gonna take uh, that light gray on top and I'm making it kind of lighter towards the corners down here as well. What I can do is I can lock those transparent pixels so that any, th any color that I do will only color on the lines, all right? So I'm gonna pick a dark gray here and I'm gonna color this dark gray on a new layer using our blending techniques that I showed you basically coloring inside the lines, all right? So just making it a little bit more smooth and uh, defining some of these lines right here, right? We'll make sure that we're on a clipping mask so that we're not coloring outside the lines, cool. On top of that line layer, we'll just do some of these. And this is kind of like a cheap way to do it, but it works. Now, if you're not satisfied with that, go to levels, oh wait, hold on. Make sure it's set to a clipping mask. Bring up the white levels, bring down the medium levels so that there's more contrast. And then you gotta look and see what's working and what's not. And there will be times when you put the light part on the where it's supposed to be dark and the other way around. So that's when you just reverse it. So we'll put this light part at the bottom and we'll put this dark part at the top. You can either do that by painting or by selecting that part, control T, and just flipping it around. And if you wanna make a crack, just do like a uh, dark shape, do the highlight at the bottom. Done. Easy. And so you can see, I just, I basically did that, but messed with it over and over and over and over and over and over and over until I got something that looked like that. Now, if you're not liking the way that the color is, gray, very boring, right? We're gonna go hue and saturation, we're gonna go colorize, make sure it's set to um, clipping mask. We're gonna make it a little bit blue, bring the saturation down so it's not super blue. Then what we can do is create a new one that's a gradient map, create a clipping mask for that. Doesn't look good, click on this thing. So we'll change this to a bluish color and mess with these until you get a result that you like. Good enough. Then I'm gonna bring the opacity down. So I'll put it like that. Now you have some shiny metal. Is it perfect? No. Does it get the job done? Maybe, probably, sometimes. And so there are moments when you'll have different textured metals. Some of it will be shiny. Some of it will be very matte, which means not very shiny. If it's shiny, you need more contrast. Lighter lights, darker darks. And if you want it to be matte, then you want um, the lights and the darks to blend in to each other very well. Now, let's talk about this polished wood look. So I'll create this cylinder with a brown color. Create a clipping mask, go to multiply. We're gonna create that, uh, you know, light purplish thing for the outside. Create another one, but this one's gonna be a little bit yellowish, orangish. And this one's gonna be set to soft light. Less saturation though. Create another layer. Blend those two together, baby. So I'm basically just picking that middle brown and kind of going over everything a little bit. All right, now we have our the base for our wood. And it's actually good when you're doing wood to not have it perfectly perfect, perfectly perfect, because it almost looks like grains, the, the, the wood grain, you know? I wouldn't wanna do wood with an airbrush. Create a line of white, and I will go in with an airbrush to erase it, and just decrease the opacity, and I make it thin. Depending on um, how you change the base color and stuff, make this a lot darker. Increase the saturation a little bit. And we'll do that with this layer too. Now it's a mahogany.
but you can see just like the sphere there is the base color shadows highlights and then the specular highlight which is that white line and if you wanted to go insane in the membrane say it was like right next to a blue wall you're gonna see that wall bouncing off all right the further away we put that wall instead of doing that you would maybe get like that let's make this not polished wood and let's just make this the type of wood that's like um, this guy right here all right I'll show you exactly how I did that so we'll take this color make it a little bit brighter a little bit less saturation and we'll do this uh, chalk brush just because it's I don't know why I choose a chalk brush it's just an easy one 100% opacity and it doesn't even matter what your squiggly line is that you start with. But from here on out, we're just gonna make some squigglies. Good enough, create a mask, and then you can erase it with a big soft airbrush. Now, black hides the effect and white reveals the effect. So we're just gonna only make it so that the texture is being shown in the middle. Now you have a plank of wood. So that should be basically all the techniques that I used. I didn't even put any texture on the feathers. I'm just leaving them blue because I don't care. That's it for the painting techniques. That's, that's all there is. You can create a plank of wood in five minutes. Easy. You see this stuff online, you're like, oh my god, it looks so good. How do you do that? And then, and then you look at the program and you're like, oh my gosh, there's like five layers that go into it. Okay, but hold on, hold on, hold on. No, just chill out, okay? You start with a brown, you do that multiply layer, you do the highlight layer, blend them, and then create the little brrrr with a lighter version of the brown that you already have, and it's done. It doesn't look as impressive when you put bump up the layers like that. So I think that might be part of why artists are so hard on themselves, because they've seen it be created, they see all the all the tricks and all the the dumb stuff that goes into it all the times that you know you turn a mistake into into a, a technique all the times that um, you're trying your hardest just to make it not look bad to get something that looks okay but then when somebody sees it fresh for the first time they're like wow see somebody make something like this I'm like whoa you're really good I wish I could be that you are <laughs> You are. I think in a lot of ways you're not as good as you think you are, and I think in some ways you're better than you think you are. When you see your creation come to life, it's easy to forget that there's magic when it comes to seeing artwork. And I think that's why we get so down on ourselves when we see somebody else and want to be like them, want to be as good as them. And maybe you're not as good as somebody else, technically, but if you're making art, then you're, you know, you're already winning the game. So many artists get discouraged and, and give up. It's easy to be able to say, oh, I know how to make metal look shiny. But if your drawing doesn't have the right vibe and it doesn't look good in the first place, it's gonna suck, no matter how nice you shade it. In fact, I, took a, I went to a bathroom. In a public bathroom, there was a, a picture of Abraham Lincoln. I took a picture of it on my phone. I'll pull it up right here. And the, the drawing was all wonky, but the rendering was amazing. And I know that that's what the artist was intending, but if you weren't intending for that, you wanted to make a nice Abraham Lincoln drawing, you could say, like, I I'm really good at making skin look like skin. I'm really good at drawing hair and stuff like that. But if the base isn't good, if you're not thinking about it in the big picture, then you're just getting focused on the details. And those little details matter so much to you, but you're blind about what else is going on or looking at it as a whole. So when you do take a step back and see it for what it is, or somebody else takes a step back and sees that for what it is, then they can see through all those times that you were tunnel visioned, painting a little detail here, a little detail there. So always work from big to small. Think big picture, vibes, and then get into the nitty gritty technical detail. If I were to give you any piece of advice to take from this video, it would be 
learning how to render something to do different textures, um, learning about different Photoshop brushes, um, the tricks that you can do with a, a digital art program or with cool colors or whatever means nothing compared to that crappy 30 second sketch that you make at the beginning. That's important and that's why I ask you guys just for your ideas because it's the vibe that I'm looking for. That's all I care about. Whether you do a nice rendered drawing like this or a 30 second sketch on a napkin. It doesn't matter, the vibe is the same. If you want me to see your designs and have a chance to be in the next episode of Concept Art Class, listen up. Here it is. The next three items are leather boots. They offer a small amount of defense. Chainmail offers a large amount of defense. The Tome R Wall. It's a magical tome that increases spell ability. And a bonus item, the Gartu. The Gartu is a magical mystery item that can only be used once per game, so use it wisely. I will not be revealing what the Gartu does until after the game is completed, so I'm curious to see what you come up with. Post your designs to Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, or the Zabio Arts fans Amino using the hashtag Zabio Arts Armor. And remember, these are the last items before we get into the spells and abilities and monsters and eventually our heroes. And remember, I don't care about good art or bad art. It's your ideas that I value. You have a beautiful brain and I'm grateful that you share it with the world. Let's make some weird stuff. These concept art class videos take a hella long time to make because I put a lot of work into them and even more love. But until episode three drops, uh, I'll have some smaller tutorials sprinkled in for you. So if you can, if you would be able to, I would be eternally grateful if you subscribed and put the bell notification on. It helps me out way more than you even know. I'm trying to make this my living. So anything like that helps a lot. And if you can't subscribe and turn the bell notification on, then do me a favor and be kind to yourself. You're doing great. Watch a video, have some fun. Put something good in your body, like some water or vegetables or tar. See you in the next video, you're really gonna like it.